Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're fixing to get started. Uh, how many of you was in Sunday school this morning? Did you see the questions that God asked Job? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever put that in place where you realize that God has got everything in control, including your life? So we, we need to think about those questions and realize the power that God has and what he's doing in our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love, and we just thank you for who you are and what you've done in our life, Father. We just pray, Father, for, for so many things in our lives, Father. But, Lord, we, we need to look to you with a humble heart, Father. Lord, just realize that you've got it all under control. And thank you again for loving us. We thank you for Brother Mike. Just ask that you speak to him this morning. Be with Waylon, Father, as he uh, leads our song service. Lord, just help us all to, uh, to see you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Got a couple of announcements to make real quick. Uh, I'll start off by next Saturday. We're having a work day here at the church. Wayne's got a lot of stuff that needs to be done, light fixtures clean, some flower bed work and other stuff. But also got a lot of work for the men to do. But uh, Miss Beverly could use some help in the children's department. They have a room they're going to clean out over there. So any ladies that want to show up, she'll be tickled to have the help. Uh, she also has a sign-up sheet on the welcome table for the area you want to work in. Sign up and let her know that you're going to help with Bible school. Bible school starts on June the 19th. And it's from 515 to 8. We need help, just fill out a sheet and let her know where you'd be willing to work. Uh, I keep wondering, I'm looking for my wife, she ain't here. Young at Heart is Tuesday at 11 o'clock. The men are cooking the meal for the ladies. So we'll be frying fish for all the senior adults Tuesday also. That's our Young at Heart Day. She's got some games planned, so you need to bring a picture of you and your mother so she can, it's a game to kind of match them up, as, see who goes babies, with who. As babies. As we'll babies. We'll try to match you up. Yeah. She knows more than I do. <laughs> I, I'm always going to get it backwards. But please talk to my wife. She can straighten you out. <laughs> like she has me over the years. <laughs> All right, tomorrow night we're having a prayer time. I knew the word. Thank you, preacher. It was just running around up there. Uh, Wednesday night we're going to do something different. We're not going to have supper. We're not going to do a Wednesday night supper this week because of all the stuff and the preparations for Mother's Day next week. We'll have breakfast for mom next Sunday morning. And uh, I think that's all. Any senior citizen, I forgot. We're going to Hawaii in just a few minutes. Right after Brother Mike gets through preaching, we're going to Hawaii. You get on this plane right out this door here. So everybody stay. All, all the senior citizens stay and enjoy what Kathy has prepared for us over here. I don't know if Wayne can hear me, but we need a light bulb in the children's restroom, please. Um, just a reminder, today I would like to get everybody that's a senior graduating from high school or college, I've got form, I can give you a form or send you a form and I need photos sent to me so we can get our 
graduation Sunday um, evening service planned out at, on Sunday, May the 28th. It's during the evening service. It'll start at 6 p.m. And we're going to have a finger food fellowship afterwards. So if you're able to bring a finger food, that would be great. And we'll celebrate our seniors graduating. Okay, thanks. All right, let's stand together. We praise the Lord for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Be thy the
folks day today, I'm, I'm sorry, senior adult day today. <laughs> who better to have come sing with me this morning than my two old folks in my life who I go to when I need prayer and guidance from... And, and money. Huh? money. And money. Yeah. Money, yeah. And my, <laughs> he'll do, he's more of a guard. He, he's too young.
I'm gonna get beside him myself when I get beside the key that day. I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. Well, I don't know why I become a little shy when I get around a whole lot of people. And I can't figure out why I never can shout about the love that floods my soul. I must confess I can't express the feelings deep inside me. The things I know but cannot show one day will overflow. I'm gonna let the glory roll when the roll is calling glory. I'm gonna get beside of myself when I get beside the King that day. I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. Well, I'll pass the clouds and shout so loud it may sound like thunder. My cheerful eyes may fill the skies until it looks like rain. And as I leave this world past the gates of pearl and stand before the Savior, I'll let my soul and let the glory roll from the road He calls my name. Y'all stand with me and sing it. I'm gonna let the glory roll when the road is called in glory. I'm gonna get beside of myself when I get beside the King that day. I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. I'm gonna let the glory roll when the roll is called in glory. I'm gonna get beside of myself when I get beside the King that day. I'm gonna have the time of my life when the time of my life is over. I'm gonna get carried away when I get carried away. I'm gonna get carried away, carried away when I get carried away. Y'all have a seat. All right, look on the screen up there. We're going to start putting that up every Sunday when the music's over. I think that's a ploy because I keep forgetting to say it. So we got to make sure it's up there. All right, children, head on out. Brother Whalen and Miss Roxy just don't understand. We a bunch of dead Baptists. We ain't going to clap on them songs, are we? Boy, I tell you, you got to watch this bunch. We got to keep an eye on this bunch. You know, Baptists are going to be the first ones up in the resurrection. Don't you know that? We're going to be the first ones caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Because the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to rise first. So there's no doubt it's going to be us. <clears throat> I mean, y'all may as well get that down right now. I mean, you couldn't light a stick of dynamite and get them fired up. The title of the message today, Doing Right When Wrong Would Be Easier, or More Convenient, or Culturally Correct, or Pleasing to the Majority, Doing What's Right. Doing what's right when the wrong would be easier. I thought about that today. I, I thought about uh, like when we go over for the, the, to eat here in a little while. And I've seen what they're preparing over there. It's good. It's buffet style. And I'm telling you, I've, I was really considering letting us out of here in about five minutes. <laughs> I'm talking, I'm talking, get, but Miss Kathy probably wouldn't have it ready in five minutes, and, and that would be doing what was easy instead of doing what was right. So I'm going to do what's right instead of what's easy right now. Uh, um, some of you, I look out there, some of y'all got blankets wrapped around you because you're freezing to death, right? Freezing to death. I'm going to tell you, 
you skinny folks, I about had enough of y'all. All right, I'm telling you right now, if y'all just put a little more weight on, and this bunch is losing weight around here, I'm telling you, there's so many folks losing weight. We've lost three members just by the weight loss. <laughs> just, just by the weight loss. And, and uh, if they would, the easy thing is to lose weight. The hard thing is to stay healthy like me. So when, the, so when the drought comes from Joe Biden leading us as a president in this nation, and we don't have nothing to eat, I'm going to last a long time when y'all are wore out. When y'all are wore out, I'm going to last a long time. So y'all just keep that in mind, all right? We finished the book of Hebrews last week, and so I want to do a message today. I'm going to start next Sunday from Mother's Day to Father's Day talking about the home. We're going to preach about the home and what goes on in the home. And, but this week I want to talk to you, because I think it's so culturally relevant today, is doing what's right when it would always be a lot easier sometimes just to do what's what's wrong you know to do that which fits in and doesn't get you criticized and and everybody kind of goes along with that or most of the people um, being in the minority is not always easy being the one that stands for truth is not always easy believe me when I went down to the Capitol last Wednesday a couple of weeks ago and we were kind of pushing that bill believe me we were in the minority <laughs> and um It'd be easier to just stay home and let the world do what it wants to do and let the devil have his heyday, but that's not the best way to do things. And so today I want to talk about doing right when wrong would be easier from Daniel chapter 3, and I think these young men, Daniel, and then the ones referred to as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, if you watch Veggie Tales, it's Shadrach and Benny, all right, just want to make sure y'all understand who they are. Um, uh, what a great story about doing what's right when it would have been a lot easier to do what was wrong and not been nearly the consequences of doing what was wrong. Uh, in Daniel chapter 3, I'm just going to start with reading the first seven verses and uh, listen to what it says. Now, you remember this. The children of Israel had been taken away captive to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon. And he had been influenced. He was an easily influenced leader. And some of his leaders could come in and, and tell him, you need to do this. He said, that's a good idea. If it, if it helps me, that's a good idea. And so uh, they had come in and said that we think everybody needs to worship you, king. We put this statue up and, uh, of you, of what really represents you, and, and that we want everybody to worship you. Bow down when we put this thing up. Everybody bow down and worship that. Well, these young boys weren't going to do that. And they were offended by that, and they stood against the government, against what was politically acceptable in their day. And Nebuchadnezzar, here's what he says, The king made the image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits, and the width of 6 cubits, and set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurer, the, judge, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officers of the provinces, in other words, his cabinet, to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province gathered together for the dedication of the image that the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They herald a cry, uh, then a herald cried aloud, uh, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, languages, that at, this at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and symphony, with all kinds of music, you'll fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace." So at that time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the symphony with all kinds of music and all the people, the nations, the languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Let's pray. Fathers, we look at this subject today. It's a subject that we wrestle with. We start young in life of just trying to fit in and God, we're tempted to, to, uh, to not cause waves. We're tempted to... Uh, be easy and uh, 
to just go along and get along. And Father, we know that sometimes you, you call us to a different life. You call us to be holy in an unholy world. And you call us out of the world. And so, Father, today I pray you would speak to our hearts. And I pray that we might learn something, God, that might show us why that it's worthwhile to stand for truth in a, a, a world that leans toward falseness and false truths. And God, today we ask you to speak and to be glorified in what's said and done here in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I know most of you are very familiar with this story. And so uh, I just want to helpfully help you with the application of it today as we look at this story. Uh, I, I pulled up this article this week. Uh, Hal Elrod, who did a book called the, Morning, the Miracle Morning, he writes this. We mistakenly assume that, the, that each choice we make and each individual action we make is only affecting that particular moment or that circumstance. He's saying that's a, uh, that's a mistake to think it's just affecting today because it can affect us for years to come. But it isn't, he says. We work out the workout we skip, the project we procrastinate on, the meeting we cancel. They're all marginalist, marginal losses. They compound and... While they're imperceptible and inconsequential to us today, one day we have no choice but to take notice. The choice to say yes to comfort and no to stretching yourselves affects more than one incident. It becomes a call set in motion, a reason to perpetuate undesired behaviors again and again. Ultimately, you have to choose between the easy thing and the right thing. Every time you choose to do the easy thing instead of the right thing, you're shaping your identity, he writes. You're becoming the type of person who does what's easy rather than what's right. If you want to move, forward, move towards where you want to be, you need to do what's right. This is how self-discipline is built. You make time and, and lay one brick at a time, and especially when you don't feel like it. He gives us an example here. He says, take waking up, for example, in the morning when the alarm clock goes off and you have a choice. You can either hit the snooze button, go back to sleep, the easy thing. Or you can do something different. You can get out of bed and achieve your goals, exercise, meditate, read your Bible, etc., whatever it might be, the right thing. We have to decide whether we're going to live as the easy way. And, you know, we, we call it cutting corners, don't we? I remember... In school, going to school, you could, always, you could always cut corners and say, I'm not going to study tonight, I'm just going to cheat off somebody tomorrow. Or I'll make a cheat sheet and take it to class with me. Or you could work hard and do what was right. You could be one of those that says, I just want to make a C or D, I just want to pass. I'm just trying to get out of here. I don't care about making A's and B's. Just do enough to get by. Just do enough to get through the day. We do that sometimes, and I don't believe God's pleased with us when we compromise, if you will, on what is truth in this life. When He needs us to stand, He needs us to stand for truth. I've battled this in our convention. I've battled it in our our nation and in the church and in seminaries. I, I, I (laughs) I don't know if I'd say fortunate enough or unfortunate enough to have become a pastor back in 1985 and... My first convention of the SBC was back in 85 when we were, we were really battling whether or not we were going to believe the Bible or not. We had commentaries that had been written, Broadman commentaries written that denied the miracles of, denied that the Garden of Eden was a real place and the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil were real trees. And, and, and just, just questioning so many things. You may not have realized all that, but it was a fact. We questioned whether God really did. I mean, there was quotes in there like, nah. The axe head didn't really float on the water. I mean, that's just kind of a parable. That's a myth. That stuff didn't really happen. And, and, you know, that was being promoted by us. And uh, it was going on and on and on. More and more liberal theology. And we had to, as a convention, stand up and say, no, that's not where we're going. We're seeing some of that today. It'd be easier to go along with the culture of today. It'd be easier to just go along and say, well, I know that Bible says it's wrong, but oh, we believe it's okay. Ah, we're just going to compromise a little bit here and a little bit there. Before long, you're way off track with God. And you've, just, you've created a new religion 
You've created a religion after your idea of God instead of the Bible's idea of God. We're not going to do that here. And uh, I pray we don't do that as a convention. And although I'm seeing more and more of those issues uh, dealt with today, I got in a big deal last night on Facebook with some, some of them, these young Reformed preachers today think they can sit around and drink and party. And, and they, they, were, they were, well, the Bible doesn't say you just can't do it. And I, I said, yeah, I said, the Bible doesn't say you ain't not to be a pot smoker or a weed smoker too and pop some drugs. I said, I guess you're going to do that next. They quit talking to me after that. <laughs> I don't know about them. But uh, anyway, we have to sometimes speak what is truth. And we have to decide whether or not we're going to do what is wise and blessed in the sight of God. And be holy as God says, be holy. I want you to notice a few things with me about this this morning. First of all, note their spiritual, these young men's spiritual comprehension. That's what I was reading about there in those. They, they heard this story. There's this image that's been built. And in other words, idolatry, this image of gold, y'all going to bow down. It represented the king, and they're going to bow down and worship that. But if you have never taken the time and gone back and looked, read, go back and read chapter 1. If you're not really familiar with these stories, when you get home today, go back and read chapter 1 of the book of Daniel. And when these young men were taken captive into Babylon and and how that they were uh, how that they were elevated if you will because of their intelligence because I believe because the hand of God was on them they were brought kind of into the king's palace and and they were told to be given this special diet to eat of all the king's food and drink of the king's wine and and they said we're not going to do that and uh, and, and we're not going to get involved in all that we're not going to the, they actually used the word. They said, we're not going to defile ourselves with these things from the king's table. In other words, we're not going to live the way the king lives. We believe that we're going to trust our lives to God, and God's going to bless and honor that. And so let me point out three things that I thought was unique about them from chapter 1. First of all, they, were, they committed themselves during a tough time. It's a tough time today to do what's right. It's a, maybe not nearly as tough as they were having, but, but they had to stand when it would have been easier to not take a stand. And then, and then second of all, they were committed at a tough age. They were young people. Hey, youth, they were young people. They were youth age. God had put them in a position when they needed to stand when it would have been easier to go along and defile themselves with the things of the king's table. And they said, we're not going to do that. Hey, when does it start? When do you start standing for what's right? Well, you know, we may say, well, when you get to be an adult and you get married and you have your kids and you have your own family. Sadly, that's when a lot of people do start standing for truth. It's when they get their own family and they have kids and they have responsibilities now to be an example for their kids. Shame we don't do that when we're youth. Amen? When we don't stand for truth, when we start as children. And we ought to stand for what's right, no matter what our age, and we shouldn't compromise with the world. So they were at a tough age, and, and thirdly, they were committed during a time when it was a tough truth. It, verses 8 through 14 of that first chapter, man, it, it's pretty, pretty uh, clear right there where they stood, and, and he clarified to them that the, verse 8, they purposed in their heart that they would not defy. He, Daniel said, I won't defy myself with a portion of the king's delicacies and with the wine which he drank. Hmm. That would have been interesting to include that in my discussion last night. But defiling themselves and, and how important that should have been for them to say, we want to be different. And they went on and they said, I tell you what, do. Let us just live the life that we believe. Let us eat what we want to eat. Let us eat the things that we believe are appropriate. And you look at us in a few days and if we don't look fine. In fact, he went back and looked at them later and he said, you guys look better than you did look before. You look better than those who've been eating of the king's food. Man, what's going on in your life? And he said, whatever it is, you go ahead and keep doing the same thing. And they were, they were blessed because they did stand for what was truth and what they believed their faith had called them to live. But what spiritual comprehension these young men, these youth had for what was right. A second thing I want you to see is their spiritual condemnation. 
Anytime you stand for truth, sometimes there's going to be those who come along and condemn you. There are going to be those who want to say, you know, well, you shouldn't be standing. You should just go along to get along. Uh, being a good Christian means just fitting in with the devil, having a comfortable place with the devil. And I'm here to tell you it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. You don't have to compromise with the devil. God calls us to be different in this world. If we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, there was an antichrist spirit in the Garden of Eden. The old devil himself came down to that Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent, and he, he set out to, to uh, dissuade, to disinform uh, Adam and Eve, and to try to get them to disobey God. He's always done that. He's always tried to bring that condemnation. We know they had condemnation. Man, old Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego there in chapter 3, verses 8 to 12, there were those who hated them because they would not go along to get along and do that which was easy and that what the culture and the government said was okay. At certain times, Chaldeans, it said, came forward, verse 8, and they accused the Jews. There's always going to be folks to accuse you today. I don't think most of you heard me. Daniel, is my mic working today? Is everything okay up here? I'm not sure it's working. But uh, did, did, you, did you hear me back there on the back row? All right. Uh, hey, there's always going to be someone to accuse you. The Bible says the devil is an accuser of the brethren. Are you counting yourself among the brethren? Are we willing to be so different from the world that the devil doesn't like it? We ought to live our life in such a way that it makes the devil need an extra pain pill that day. That it makes him want a little more therapy that week. Because I believe that we are in that business of winning for Christ. I believe we're in that business of glorifying Christ. That any Christ spirit is always against whatever is good. Put those, you know, when I think about that, it's always there to say, I want bad. I, I don't know about you, but I'm amazed at that spirit that seems to flow through our nation today. Uh, and I've kind of been on a tear here lately to put things on there about people who've been set free from different lifestyles, whether it's homosexuality or whatever it may be, and they get up and they give their testimonies or transgenderism, and I love to put those videos on there that talks about how God set them free. Well, let me tell you something. If God can set you free, it must have been bondage you was in in the first place. There's a spirit of condemnation in this world that says what is good is evil. And what is evil is good. What God calls good is bad. And what we call good, God calls bad. There's that spirit in this world. And I want you to understand that we're involved in a spiritual warfare. Every day, we're involved in a spiritual warfare. And I know some of you just, it's easier just to blend in. And, 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 and listen, ignoring truth is not love. It is not love. We can speak the truth in love, the Bible says. Sometimes anytime you speak truth, some don't want to hear it. But I'm here to tell you, we speak the truth in love. And telling the truth is love. Truth is sometimes hard, isn't it? Sometimes truth is tough. It's called tough love. We have to have that sometimes. And in our lives. So I just say that to say that even these young men, as stellar of examples that they were of God, and as much as they stood, they still had their negative criticism. They had that condemnation. Uh, and and they, they, it wasn't easy to do what they did. A third thing, note their spiritual challenge. Well, I thought about their spiritual challenge, verses 13 to 15. If you'll skip down there, uh, it says, And Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, uh, gave command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they wouldn't, they wouldn't bow. As it said there, uh, uh, these men, it said in verse, uh, verse 12 there, that these Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all of them, they wouldn't bow. And, and the king said, uh, Hey, guys, 
Uh, You're not going to bow. The rage, it says in verse 13, his rage and his fury. I'm here to tell you, sometimes the devil's crowd gets so angry. We don't have to be angry to speak truth. We just speak that truth and we stand for what's right. And uh, watch the devil's crowd get angry. He said to them, he said, if you don't serve, uh, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, verse uh, 14, that you don't serve my gods or worship the golden image which I've set up? Now, if you're ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horns, all the instruments playing, he says. He said, uh, I'm trying to skip on down, but if you do not worship, you'll be cast immediately in the midst of the fiery, the burning, fiery furnace. Now, these are young men that the king had looked up to and, and, and set aside because they were, they were such great examples. And um, I guess one of my favorite verses um, in the Bible come in these next couple of verses. When it says, look at verse 16, and, and I call this, note the, I say note their spiritual commitment their spiritual challenge and their spiritual commitment in verse 16 Shadrach Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king O Nebuchadnezzar we have no need to answer you in this matter if that is the case our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand O king. Underline a couple of little words in there. He is able. He is able to deliver us. And they said he will deliver us. You know what they're saying? If we die in the fire, he delivered us from you, O king. (laughs) He delivered us from this world. He delivered us into heaven and a better place. And so you notice here, so underline in your Bible there, or highlight in your Bible where it says, that the God whom we serve is able to deliver us. Well, that's an important... That when you pray, that ought to be how you pray. God, I got faith in you. You're able to take care of this. But I love verse 18 too where it says, But if not. Hello, are you with me? God, I know you got this. It may not work out like we think it ought to work out. And if it doesn't, but if not, that's okay. He goes on and says, look what he says. He says, let it be known to you, O king, that we don't serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. In other words, king, as nicely as I can say it, Drop dead. We don't need a committee meeting. We don't need an investigation to figure out where we stand on this issue. We don't need to call together for a business meeting at the church to decide. It's built inside of us. We will not. We will not. Is that built inside of you? Think about it just a moment. Is there something built inside of you that says, I'm not going to go along with the world? Is there something inside of you that says, God, you got this. Work it out how you see fit. If I die, I die. It's for your glory. But if I live, that's also for your glory. And God, I'm not going to compromise with the world. Here's what he's saying, folks. Listen, we're not going to serve your gods. We're not going to fit in. We're not going to drink your little drink. We're not going to take your pills. We're not going to do what the world does. We're not going to follow your teachings. We don't believe in evolution. We do believe God created all things. We will not compromise with the world. We do not accept that this is an acceptable lifestyle. We believe God and will not water that down. Is that the resolve you have? 
Or is your resolve just kind of every day, I kind of got to figure what's best for me. And, and as, I, as I come along to those decisions, I just kind of weigh what's popular. And I, I don't want to lose any friends over this. And, and good Lord, I might get blocked on Facebook if I take this stand. Or, or somebody might stop following my tweet. Or, or uh, TikTok may not want me on there anymore. Or I'm worried about what the world thinks. That's what's wrong with the church today. The church is trying to figure out how it can fit into the world instead of calling people out of the world. I, I want to remind you, ecclesia, the very word, the Greek word for church, means the called out ones. We're called out of the world. We're not called into the world. We're not called to be like the world. We're called to be different from the world. I love how they said, I know God can, but if He don't, <laughs> I'm okay. I ain't going to change. I'm okay. Number five, note their spiritual companion. Note their spiritual companion in verses 19 to 25. They looked down into the fire, and Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and he expressed the face on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His, his face changed toward them. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been before. Commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into burning fiery furnace. And these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and their other garments, and they were cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those who took the men to, to, uh, who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In other words, we're going to throw you in the fire. This fire is so hot, it killed all the, all the servants. It killed the soldiers. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound in the midst of the fiery furnace. And then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste, and he spoke, saying to his counselors, Didn't we cast three bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. And they're not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Who was that? Who do you think that was? I tell you, I believe it was Jesus. I believe it was Jesus. I'm telling you, Jesus can do anything. He promised us if the fires leap up around us, He'll protect us from the fires. If the waters come up around us, He'll protect us from drowning in those waters. He has promised that He will never leave us and He will never forsake us. You say, wait, 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 preacher, you forgot, you mixed up, you're confused. I know you're getting old and all that kind of stuff and your mind ain't what it used to be, but this is the Old Testament. Jesus ain't born yet. Jesus not alive yet. There is no Jesus here. Well, you misunderstand, you see, because the New Testament even teaches in Galatians and Colossians and other places that all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus, and they continue because of Jesus. And it's in Genesis chapter 1 where, where God said, let us go down and create man in our image. Did you get the us and the our, the plural term there? It's speaking of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Hey folks, Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation says. He always was and He always will be. He's just God in a human form. Oh my friend. I believe this was what's called a pre-incarnate vision of Jesus Christ. He always was. He just didn't always show himself like he did here. I believe there's other examples of that. I believe he's the one that wrestled with old, old Jacob over there in the Old Testament. I believe he's the one of those who, who came and talked to Abraham about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. I, I believe there's a lot of examples of him in the Old Testament. But, but, but whatever you believe, you can believe what you want to believe. I'll just believe because my Bible here says he was like the son of of God. Now you can come up with some other definition if you want to. I'll just believe this one. Amen? I'll believe what the Bible says. Right out beside that verse, Isaiah 43, 2. 
Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they'll not overflow you. And you walk through the fires, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. And that's what happens with these guys. I'm here to tell you there's nothing you're going to face that Jesus is afraid of. There's nothing you're going to face that Jesus can't conquer. There's nothing you're going to face that He'll ever expect you to face it alone. Because He is one with you. Number six, note their spiritual conquest. That's amazing where this story goes from here. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar goes up there and he looks in that furnace and he sees that fourth man down there and he asks all these leaders and he, he pulls up all these, all these great famous leaders. He, he has Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego brought out of the, the furnace there and And how that they had been delivered from the fire. Not even a hair of their head was singed, it says. Right now, some of you are saying, man, I don't know if I believe that. You're the same ones who say, well, born of a virgin, I don't know if I believe all that. Res resurrected from the dead, <laughs> I don't know if I believe all that. Created the stars and the moons and the planets. And he spoke and cast them into space. I don't know if I believe that. Miracles. Saying to Lazarus, come out of that tomb. And Lazarus comes back to life. And you're sitting there saying, well, I don't know if I believe that. I say to you, friend. If your God can't do those things, He's not much of a God. You see, God's not limited by what you're limited by. He's not limited by your and my human efforts and limits. My God says nothing is impossible. And that God, when that God becomes your God, you will say, He can pull these three boys out of the fire without a hair singed on their head. Because He's God of the fires. And I believe that He can create the planets out of nothing. See, I, I got a big God. And if you don't believe those things, how can you have faith? And if you don't have faith, how can you please God? You see? I like talking about faith. Have you noticed that the last few years? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you have to have faith in a big God, not a baby God. A big God. That's why we never write God out with a little G. We write God out with a big G because He's a big God. And He's the only God, right? And in fact, that's what we see proven here at the end of this chapter. Verse 26, He pulls them all out. They're not seen anywhere. And, and the fire, it says the fire had no power. And it says they didn't even smell like smoke or fire. Let me tell you something. A God like that, you ought to listen to. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar spoke saying, Blessed be the God, listen now, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God except their own. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, language which speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap. Listen now. Because there is no other God who can deliver like this. This king becomes convinced that there's just one true God. Just one. Our world doesn't want to admit that today. But there's just one God. People say, well, there's a bunch of little gods. No, there's not. 
There's just a bunch of man's ideas about little gods. There's just one God. One true God, capital T, capital G. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, you've a lot of things you don't know about. Hello? Well, my little God, well, I'm sorry you've got such a little God. We don't talk about Him here. We talk about the big God. We talk about the one true God. And He's the only one that can save you. Now, we make a lot of little gods, but they ain't God. They can't do these things. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the, in the province of Babylon. The king promotes these boys from the pit to the palace. You want to be promoted by God? You're going to have to start trusting God in the big things. When it would be easier to do what was wrong instead of doing what was right. It's not always easy to do what's right. But if you want to go from where we deserve, we deserve hell. We deserve eternity in a place called hell. That's where you are without Jesus Christ. You're in the pit. You're headed for the pit. But you want to go to the palace. You're going to have to decide that you believe God is able. Able to do what, preacher? Whatever He wants to do. Hello? Hello? Is that your God this morning? You got a big God? Or you got a little G God? If you got a little G God, I'm so sorry. You need to put your faith in the big God. The one true God. Because He can move you from the pit to the palace. Are you with me? Do you know Him this morning? Even though you all look like a bunch of delinquents with your flowery shirts on and stuff like that. Huh? Oh, I got one on too, don't I? <laughs> Any mine is Brother Hughes. <laughs> Do you know him this morning? Every person here, and by the way, everybody believes in God. The Bible says if you say you don't believe in God, you're a liar. That's what the Bible says. Don't take that up with me. Well, don't use that big word, preacher. Don't use that L word. Well, the Bible says you're a liar and truth's not in you. Does that make me unpopular? I really don't care. I really don't care. I'm going to fight this old world till I can't fight no more. I'm going to stand for truth. I'm going to stand for truth no matter what the world thinks. Everybody here this morning has either a little G God or a big G God. You say, well, I don't have no God at all. If you don't have the big G God, you are your own little G God. You do what's right in your own eyes. And you, are the, you serve a little G God. The choice is yours. This morning you're going to leave here either following little G or you're going to leave here following the big G God this morning. Who's it going to be? Brother Whalen, if y'all will come with the music right now, we're going to give an invitation. God giving you an invitation. God's giving you a choice this morning. It's so much easier to do sometimes what is wrong. But when God calls you, you're going to do what's right, even if it's harder. You're going to do what shows you have integrity. You're going to show you do what it takes to follow the big G God and, and agree with the big G God and, and stop going along with the little G God and the world. Stop being God in your own life. Trust God. Key phrases this morning. My God is able, but if not. If you don't leave here with anything else this morning, leave here with that this morning. My God is able. But if not, I'm still okay. In other words, God can do whatever I need Him to do, but if He don't do it like I think He ought to do it, I'm still okay. Boy, that ought to be our philosophy for life. 
Would you bow with me? This morning we're going to have an invitation here. It's from God for you to choose which G you're following. Little G, big G. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never committed to follow the big G God that can do all things, you can this morning. You can walk down this aisle, take me by the hand and say, Preacher, I want to follow the big G God. I want to ask Jesus to come into my life, forgive my sins, and I want to commit to follow Him. Make Him my God. You say, why do I have to come down front? You don't. There's other ways you could do it. But boy, this is a good way because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father of heaven. This is a good way to show you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. You come on this morning let God have His way. Let's stand together. Father, this morning we commit this invitation to You, God. You call. You draw people right now. You strengthen us, Father. Give us courage to be Your people in a world that that doesn't acknowledge who You are or in a world that's trying to create God in their own image. God, give us the courage to do what's right. No matter what the world thinks. Like these young boys in this story, Father, help us to be men and women of courage and faith. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we sing, you come. Weak and wounded sinners. Sing with us. Lost and left to die. Raise your head for love is passing by. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus and live. Now your burden's lifted and carried far away, and precious blood has washed away the stain. Sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus and live like a newborn baby. Don't wait on anybody else. Don't leave here following the wrong God. Man, make sure God knows whose theme you're on. Make sure God knows you don't compromise. Fall on Jesus. Fall on Jesus. Fall on Jesus. And Sometimes the way the rain come to Jesus cry to Jesus cry to Jesus and leave Amen thank you for being here this morning in the house of the Lord and uh, I hope God spoke to your heart. I hope that God, I don't know, I enjoy preaching this sermon. I don't know if you enjoyed hearing it or not, but that's really not the important part. The important part is I enjoyed preaching it. Amen. But uh, God has got this. Word for you, Katie. God's got this. He looks down in the furnace. He's here with you. We're with you. Okay? And God's, yes, ma'am? Amen. Amen. Well, it's always obvious when I leave here, I enjoyed my sermon if nobody else did or not. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Thanks for being here. We're going to close in prayer. Senior adults, I don't know what age that starts at. 55 or 60? What's that start? Huh? 60? 60 and up? It's you come over you, there. I'm sorry? you identify as. Yes, what you identify. <laughs> 
Come on, Brother Whalen. If we start with what you identify at, we'll have teenagers over there saying, I'm a tractor, I'm a bird, I'm a cat, I want to eat today. You know, I'm 65. But uh, no, uh, you, uh, you come on if you're, if you're kind of qualifying that age in the staff. If you're younger than that and you're on staff, we, you're invited to stay too, be a part of that. But, but thank you for being here uh, today. Tonight at 5.30, we're going to come back together to study our... Our men's study is in the fourth week. I think I guess it's the fourth week for the ladies too. Is that right, Miss Lynette? Is this week four or five? Maybe five for y'all. Y'all had six weeks, seven weeks? No, y'all did a week. Y'all did a week. Y'all started a week earlier than us. Okay, okay. So whatever they are, I don't know, they're confused. But anyway, anyway, no, they uh they're they're doing their study at five thirty and the guys are doing their study at five thirty and so you come and be a part of that tonight and uh, you'll enjoy that. And we have a lot of things planned coming up in the next few weeks and so some different studies we're gonna do. But uh, you come be a part of that. Thanks for being here today. And uh do we know who's closing us in prayer? Which one of you deacons? Danny Stuckey. And Danny, would you say the blessing for the food over there? Father, we just thank you so much for your message this morning, Lord. We just thank you for Brother Mike. And Lord, as, uh, as we go out of these doors, Father, we just ask you to help us to, uh, to be that person, Father, that stands up for truth and stands up for you, Lord. And we just thank you for your love, and Lord, thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. And as we go next door to eat, Lord, we just ask that you bless the food, bless the ones that prepared it, and Lord, just uh, be with us all and help us to enjoy ourselves, Father. And uh, Lord, just uh, to praise you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.